Eva, you are part of the ANC, recently admitted to the NEC, am I correct? I recently co-opted to the NEC. I've okay. been in the ANC since the early 80s. Yes. So you wrote a very interesting column the other day about pensions, the usage of pensions as per perhaps a financing mechanism for ESCOM, um, you know, in regards to the whole Kasati plan. Can you give us a quick sum up of what you said in the article for anyone who hasn't heard it? Um, so we can take it through to the likes of Mike and Azai and hear from them as to how this could function. Because just to set this scene, we've come from a discussion this morning that has acknowledged that you need to start aligning policies more in South Africa. We've come to realize that in terms of fiscal policy, which really, in my view, sums it all up, brings it all together, we need, we need an answer, we need a solution, but one that's actually credible, one that makes fiscal policy not change very much from one budget to the next. So hence, we're at the solution on ESCOM, it's involving pensions, you've written about it. Can you just quickly give us a quick summary of that? Uh, yeah, I think that the, the, it was actually about the issue of the rescue of ESCOM, and the argument was really that um, whatever we do with ESCOM is going to cost us. And that the best option is, in fact, this option of getting a long-term refinancing from resources from the GPF. And the reason is that on the one hand, the other options were all much worse. Um, and sometimes you just can't, you know, the first best would be ESCOM fixes itself. That's not going to happen. And whatever we do, it's going to cost a lot of money. Um, but the advantage of funding it from the GEPF is on the one hand, the pensioners themselves are largely protected because it's a defined benefit fund. And on the other hand, from the standpoint of most pension fund members, as opposed to wealthy people who have other assets, it's probably more important for them to say, you know, when I retire, my kids will have jobs. And also that I won't just lose my job because we fail with ESCOM. And we have seen mass retrenchments across the economy. And downward pressure on the public service because the state would end up also having less resources. So that from that standpoint, it's better for the pensioners in the long run. Um, and the alternatives are all worse. I mean, what are you going to do? You can double the tariffs. We heard what that would do in the previous session. You can take the money off the budget, but then you again see downward pressure on public servants, and you also see downward pre pressure on services. And I do think in the current state, we tend to always talk about why we need to, with the history of state capture, why we need to address the concerns of business, but we also need to address the concerns of voters who are also getting very fed up. And if we simply start cutting services, I think that would lead to a much worse situation in the country. I mean, just to flag, all of this takes place in one of the most unequal countries in the world. So when you talk about why is there continual policy contestation, that's why. Now, I do think the one thing that's difficult, is what I was arguing in the article, is that if you're advising people on pensions, you're generally trained to say, um, how do I get you the biggest pension when you retire um, without causing you too much pain? So I can see where it's difficult for people who are used to advising pensions to say, you know, you should be going into the higher returns, the higher security instruments. But I think that it's better if we look at the position of the pensioners and say, what do they actually need? Very good. So Mike, I'd like you to respond to that. Give us your thoughts on the current policy topic at hand. Well, without being too geeky about it, if you look at the PIC, or the Government Employer Pension Fund, which has got $1.8 trillion in assets, it's got one kind of eight trillion dollar in sorry rands in liabilities. So these are not unencumbered assets. These are assets against liabilities. But at the moment, uh, PIC uh, or the GPF has 90 billion rands worth of ESCOM bonds that they already own, which is five percent of their total assets. If you put the 250 billion in, which is the ESCOM bailout, it then becomes 340 billion rand, which is 19 percent of total assets. Now, no pension fund on a concentration basis, can have that amount of money sitting in one asset. And that Eskom debt, 340 billion, now becomes 57% of their total bonds. And you can't have 57% in bonds. So, ESC, so then the PRC will then have to start selling government bonds. If it starts selling its government bonds, then of course the price of those bonds is going to fall, interest rates are going to go up. So your consequences are massive. So the PRC will probably reject this. Because no investment committee or asset liability committee can say we're going to take on a burden of this size. So the issue then becomes, how do you fund this? Where does this go? Now, there's two options. One is prescribes, and we don't have time to go back into prescribes, but prescribes were a disaster when they were around. 
There were negative interest rates through the 70s and 80s. Uh, equities, which were crowded in, gave very positive interest rates. So if you were in equities in the 70s, you made a positive return at 24% per annum. If you were in bonds, you made a negative return, negative real return over that period. So it basically destroyed a lot of the wealth in the 70s and 80s. And we'd have the same consequences now. So the pension fund industry, and this was, I think, the previous speaker said, well, how did they come to the party? Now, John Oliphant had a very good article, I think it was yesterday in Business Day. He said, listen, we've got this governmental development investment framework, which the GPF has already got, where the GPF funds infrastructural investments through private equity, through investment in real assets. And that's 5% of their portfolio, and most of that's taken up. But if you start doing this across the entire pension fund industry, and you say, right, let's start putting some of our money into this developmental finance. Now, here we're talking not about just giving the money to Sanrel or giving the money to... You're saying, let's put projects in place. So if Sanrel wants some money, they come along and say, right, we want to build... We want to put the N2 through Somerset West so people can get to a minus. They can go through Somerset West in 10 minutes and not in two hours. But then you've got to take that project and say, can that thing be funded? And are people prepared to pay tolls because they get, want to get to a minus you know, an hour and a half earlier than, than going through Somerset West and all those bottlenecks, then you can put a project together. If you put a project together, the pension fund industry can fund it. If you go into renewable energy, REIDD, or whatever they call it, ID, IPP, renewable energy takes two years to operate. There's already 200 billion rand in renewable energy projects. There's going to be another two, three, 400 billion rand in renewable energy in the next year or two. 24 months, those things are up and running. So a pension fund can go in and say, right, we'll fund some of this. Because in two years' time, we've got cash flows. And so what we need to look at in the pension fund industry is how do we come, how do we start providing the solutions? So what is an, a, a, quite an attractable problem. I agree 100% with uh, what Neva says. But you can't put that burden purely onto the pensioners who are in the GPF. Because in the end, it's a defined benefit fund, and we'll all have to pay for that. We as taxpayers will have to pick up that slack. So we must find the solutions um, in the private pension industry. Perfect. Azai, anything you'd like to add from your side on how this could work or why it would not work? I think the, the underlying problem is that ESCOM has been um, a negative uh, return on equity institution. So if you look at it from that point of view, it's quite risky for any money to be put, which comes from, from pensioners. Ultimately, those that manage, manage pensions, they have a fiduciary duty to look after their members. And to the extent that there is a perceived risk of putting money into an institution which is not going to function well, that is problematic. But also, if you look at the current pace of renewable energy, the current position that has been taken by government to say, private sector can generate their own electricity, it means ESCOM is going to die a slow death. Ultimately, as more energy comes from the private sector, the demand for ESCOM's electricity declines, its revenues also decline. So when we say we fund ESCOM, what exactly are we trying to, to solve? I think a fiscal transfer could be um, a, a solution. The country takes a risk, a fiscal a transfer, and the whole citizenry through tax, taxes they pay for ESCOM, instead of just making only a few uh, those that contribute to, to pension funds pay for it. So just do a, a fiscal transfer and then we solve it and deal with the consequences that comes with a downgrade and everything else. So Neva, how, what, what, from here on, who's driving the, the policy decision on what to do with government pension funds? And if there was really a and, and, and Mike, I know you and I were talking about before that. But if there is an additional fear that this starts to move towards prescribed assets as, as such, which many would perceive to be a big risk on the economy, how do you think government would be able to mitigate against, against that fear by using public pension funds um, as a financing mechanism, even if partially? Is, is it possible? Can you do one and without the other? Okay, so, so um, I should start by saying I used to work for Cosatu. 
Yeah? So I've had these debates for many, many years. And this thing about the fact that workers who have pension funds really genuinely do have a different perspective on how the money should be used from their advisors. And that I think it's something people need to reflect on. That if members are genuinely saying, we want the economy to be transformed so that we have more opportunities and our children have more opportunities, more than we want an extra couple hundred rand on our pension fund. Remember, the, the median pension fund member, their income is 7,000 rand a month. You know, we're talking peanuts here in terms of the differences, in terms of the actual value of their income, even though it will mean a lot to them, obviously. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you're sitting here now and you're looking at your kids never getting a job quite possibly when you retire, and you're going to be supporting them on your pension, that's a much bigger hit than saying, if they're employed, I could accept 10% you know, less on my pension. And I think we need to really, you know, this is a highly unequal society. If we don't put ourselves in the position of the majority, we will make mistakes. Having said that, I do think that um, from the standpoint of prescribed assets, obviously, I don't think that would be a disaster. I'm not saying it's desirable. In mm -hmm. terms of who makes the decision, you know, there's the politics and there's and the socioeconomic situation, and there's the legalities. The socioeconomic situation is, if there's not a strong enough coalition in favor of this, it won't go through. Mm -hmm. yeah? So that's why we're having this kind of debate. Legally, it's up to Treasury because it's a defined benefit fund, so the state as employer decides. And Trevor, sorry, Michael's looking at me in shock, but it's true. That's, Trevor fought like hell for that. So the deciding vote, although the trustees are selected by both sides, the deciding vote is with government yeah? because the employer takes the risk. So really, the risk to pensioners is more that either they change the rules on the defined benefit if there's a squeeze, or they don't do the cost of living increase for existing pensioners. No? But legally, they would have to actually change the law for the first of those. No? Um, and so it's, it's, it's really the taxpayer who would likely end up paying more if this thing went into default. And the only advantage of this thing for taxpayers from that standpoint is otherwise we're going to spend the money up front. No? And this way it gets, even if there is a problem, I mean, I agree that all the solutions for ESCOM see it losing market share. No? And we don't talk about this very much, but it does. And it ends up with them writing off quite possibly some of their assets sooner than they otherwise would like to. So there is a risk of a cost, but it would, this would spread it over many years as opposed to having it be upfront for taxpayers and it would lead to like a, I worked it out, it's around a four or 5% cut in the budget uh, in other services if we actually just paid for it straight out of the government. And I think, you know, this is the point. You can't just examine an option in the abstract and say, do I like it? You have to say, what is the least worst? Because really the, you know, the bad decisions were taken in the past. And now we're just trying to clean it up.